Hey, Matt. Steve. Hey, Matt. Steve, where are you today? Are you still at home? I am in uh, I am at the the, the uh, NAND Research home base in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Where are you? You're on the road? I'm in Las Vegas at Dell Tech World 2023. I was getting my tea together. Sorry. It's a person. And we are, we are joined virtually uh, for the latest Hillstone Network cybersecurity tech talk. Yeah. Before we introduce our guests, um, I want to throw out some, I want to just throw out some interesting facts uh, around that I uncovered as I was looking through things. So All right. uh, we're going to be focusing, today's going to have like a beach theme, an island theme, a tropics theme. Um, and specifically in the, depending, I, I said this earlier, the Caribbean or the Caribbean, depending on whether you're American or British um, or something else. Some interesting facts. Um, Caribbean. Population of the Caribbean, as I saw it, is about 45 million people. Um, the largest island has, uh, well, let's forget about the largest island. The smallest island has zero people. It's uninhabited, and it's a disputed island between the U.S. and, uh, I think it's the U.S. and Puerto Rico, which happens to be a territory of the U.S., which is strange enough, or maybe it's Haiti. Um, the... Uh, combined GDP, as best as I can tell, and I'm going to be corrected on this, I know, it looks to be about, um, I think it's about $400 billion or so. Um, I might be overshooting that a little bit, um, but there are some big contributors to that GDP. 34 islands, um, and a lot of stuff happens there. Oil refinery, pharmaceutical manufacturing, uh, financial services, lots of agriculture, and of course, tourism and such, right? So it's not but just it, cruise ships and scuba divers. There's a lot happening in the Caribbean. There is a lot happening there. And it's interesting because you have this like really dis, you know, disparate, if you will, population and set of islands with with that all bring like really unique um value to the to the globe, right? To the global economy. Yet they're they're and they're close together, yet in, in many ways are very disconnected because they're islands. And so our, the guest we have today is um, is really interesting because he is he is heading the effort that kind of digitally connects all of this together and bring can that will enable you know the the Caribbean you know at large to really kind of leverage the strength of all to bring this like unified presence um, out into the global economy. So um, do you want to introduce our guests or do you want me to do that? No, why don't you do it, Matt? You're okay. okay, I'm going to save the best for last, and I don't. I hope the first person I introduce doesn't take offense to that. Um, our first guest is a regular, uh, Andre Cooper. He's the he's the lead technical um, technical lead for Latin America. Um, so he runs the technical stuff for Latin America for Hillstone. Super sharp guy, great friend of of the show. Uh, welcome back, Andre. It's great to see you again. Bye. And thanks all for having me this time as well. So uh, looking forward to have the conversation uh, uh, with uh, Giovanni and and you guys here. So let's kick it in. Let's you see. Just gave, you just gave away who our guest is by naming. Oh, him. sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> our guest is, in case you didn't know, is Giovanni King. Giovanni is the CEO of Blue Nap Americas. Um, he has a big, big task of, as we talked about, digitally connecting the Caribbean, which is sounds like such a cool story, but it has like technical, interesting stuff. It has social geography and geopolitical. I mean, it's so interesting. So, Giovanni, welcome to welcome to uh, welcome to the show. Um, yes, thank you very much, Matt, Steve, and Andre for having me on this um, on your show today. Um, like you said, the interesting times for the region. Um, for the globe in its entirety, and I'm very happy to be part of this development. So thank you for having me. Oh, we're sure. Sure. So so before we get into like what you're doing, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about about Blue Napping. Really cool company name, but you know there's more to it than just a cool name. You know, tell us a, a little bit about dig a little bit deeper on what we mentioned there about kind of you know what your role is and and what your goals are at Blue Nap. So I, I think it's important for us to start from the beginning. Like you said, um, so I'm Giovanni King, and I'm currently the CEO at Blue Nap Americas. Uh, it's the only tier four data center in the Caribbean. Um, previously to this, I worked as different functions in the regulatory um, agencies in the net, former Netherlands, Antilles, and St. Martin, and back in Curacao for the last um, six years. 
um, Curacao, it's very important to also realize it's part of six um, groups that are part of the Dutch kingdom. So basically, we are a small part of the EU within um, the Caribbean. Um, just from that perspective, it's, it's very important. Um, the role that Curacao has played in, in different developments um, during the history of our, of our world from supporting, um, you know, the allies during the different world wars, um, like you have indicated, um, we had refineries over here. So um, Curacao has always had that position where it would function as a gateway um, between um, Europe and the Americas in their totality and the Caribbean. So that's what one of the things that we would like to continue to build on now only from a digital perspective. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And uh, you mentioned that BlueNap is the only tier four data center. So, it's, Steve, do you want to start? I, I feel like I always jump. Do you want to start? Uh, or? Jump in. Okay. So, set the problem statement for us, Giovanni. It's a, you know, I think we said at the outset, you know, you get all these econ different economies that rely on different um, services and sectors. What's the challenge that BlueNap saw, or the, not maybe not challenge, but the opportunity? that BlueNap saw in, you know, in kind of kicking off this project to digitally connect everybody? That's a very good question. The point here is, is that if I go back a little bit, you know, almost everything is evolves around politics, like, like you've indicated in your introduction as well. So last year, during one of the main conferences in um, the Caribbean, it's called um, Canto, uh, our minister of uh, traffic, transport, and urban planning mentioned that Curacao had the the vision or the objective to position itself as a digital hub for the region. And then you would ask why a digital hub and why Curacao? So one of the main things here is that Curacao, that we think that we have all of the building blocks that basically could help us or facilitate us with taking on um, that role because of the subsea cable connectivities that we have, um, data centers that we have. We have multiple data centers on the island, one of which is our tier four blue nap that I have the honor to manage right now. We have a uh, internet exchange that is managed by one of the biggest um, exchange managers out of Europe, which is called um, AMSX, Amsterdam Internet Exchange. Uh, of course, we have our regulatory framework that supports this development as well. Like mm -hmm. I've indicated, we're part of the Dutch Kingdom, so it also facilitates um, the business between different entities because of all of the agreements that the Netherlands forms part of out of Europe and within the Americas. Um, we have very highly educated um, employees, so the workforce is very highly educated, and the, the legal and legislative framework support all of this. Mm -hmm. The reason that we think that, that becoming the hub was very important is because um, historically what you see is that Everybody looks at the region, and like you had stated in the introduction, as the different 34 islands that we are. And all of us, from the biggest to the smallest, most of the times would be seen as very small economies, right? If you look at Curacao, for instance, or our neighboring um, islands, which are Aruba and, and uh, Bonaire, we have 150,000 people. Bonaire has less than um, 20,000 people. Aruba is around 90,000 people, so really small economies. When you're looking at this whole process of the digital transition and you look at the different content delivery networks that are out there, nobody would say, well, we're going to make the investment to put our content closer to all of these 34 populations, right? So because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make business sense. But if you could create an infrastructure, a network that would connect everybody, and then from out of one location, be able to provide all of these services, it would create the efficiencies that is necessary because as you have indicated, around 45, 46 million people now, you're looking at a whole different economy of scale. Sure. So that is why we thought, well, if we can create this, if we can show what our capabilities are, and if we can show that we can do this together as opposed of individually that would then you know get the big eyes looking at the region from a different perspective and that's what we're trying to achieve by by be, by positioning ourselves as the digital hub but also showing that this is not something that we can do individually but it is a collective process we need to do it together 
And because I have the, the honor to manage the data center right now, I think because the data centers have a very important role in this digital transition that all of us are going through, this is where all of the data is stored. This is where all of the data is um, analyzed and, and processed. And this is where we should protect it mostly. That's yeah. why I think this initiative is, is, is very important because now we're open up the region and people will see it as one, at least in the in the digital ecosystem, see it as one as opposed to 34 different islands. Hey, so Giovanni, let me ask you this. When I think of a data center, if I'm a bad guy, a data center is just a big target. Are you constantly under attack? Um, there, there is pros and cons. Uh, I mean, as long as you're small and sitting in the corner of the world like we're right now, then we are not constantly out of um, <laughs> under attack. But I'm, I'm sure that the moment that we this process starts to evolve and people then are aware of because we're going to brand, um, as a matter of fact, we're starting with a branding process, introducing the brand for Curacao as a digital hub called um, uh, um, the Digital Hub Americas, we will be more known. And at that point in time, yes, I think that there will be more attacks on our, our facilities, um, just like any other facilities that are the most targeted, like hospitals and, and stuff like that. I don't I don't need to tell you guys this. You guys, you know, you know, you know where it's coming from. But yes, I think somewhere in the future, we also will have to deal with, you know, the daily approaches and the daily attacks on our facilities. Hey, and, and, you know, before we get into like the, you know, like how this all plays together from a protection perspective, let's talk a little bit more about what you're doing. So you've got 34 islands. You've got 46 million people spread across those 34 islands. There are a couple of things, a couple of vectors in there, right? The first is how do you connect all these islands um, with, you know, adequate uh, bandwidth and speed for this to be effective? And then how do you, I guess maybe three vectors, how do you, how do you build out this out so that both, you know, businesses, organizations, and people, consumers, you know, have that connected experience? I think I read somewhere that, about 60% of the folks in the Caribbean are connected to the internet today. So there's a lot of opportunity to increase that and you have to protect them, but also businesses, those hospitals um, and for-profit businesses. So what do you, what, what are you doing to kind of like create that, you know, that connective tissue from Island to Island or from Island to, to Carousel? Well, one of the things is if you look, if you normally would look at, you know, the, the subsea cable infrastructures that are, um, available to us in the region, you will see that the Caribbean is, as a matter of fact, very well connected when we're looking at the subsea cables. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, um, even though we're well connected, is the, the importance here would be, how do you make sure that we have the shortest routes? How do you make sure that we have, you know, the, the necessary latency, the necessary, um, the minimum jitter and the maximum speeds that you can have on all of these subsea cables? So by building an infrastructure um, that would enable this, this is how we think we're going to achieve, you know, that level of connectivity between the islands. Yeah. But then when it comes to connectivity upon each and every different island, we are looking at how the regulators would deal with increasing um, the coverage, increasing the usage of um, all of these um, IT type services. Now you've mentioned um, 60%. I, I will disagree with you on that because I feel <laughs> and know that we mostly talk, when we're talking about mobile connectivity and mobile um, um, coverage and usage, yeah. all of the islands are above 100%. Okay. Um, um, I mean, on most of the islands, what you will see is that most people would have um, two mobile phones for one reason or the other. Um, okay. Maybe you're in an area that is less coverage from one operator or the next, so that's why we have it, and that's why um, the the you know the coverage and the usage is as high when we're talking about mobile. When yeah. we're talking about um, fixed line connectivity, now there is the next level of um, transition that we're going through because we now see the importance, like the rest of the world, the importance of this level of connectivity. Fiber rollout is the next. Um, you know, the, the next projects that we're all are embarking on. And okay. here is where maybe the connectivity, when we're talking about maybe fiber to the home connectivity, that we are out 60% and growing. Um, okay. So there is a, a small difference there. Yeah. Totally get it. Yeah. 
And and <clears throat> interesting, like when you think about Curacao as the digital hub, Steve, I'll, I'll let you jump in after, sorry. Um, when you think about Curacao as a digital hub, we, we talked about this earlier, you brought up an interesting point, right? I mean, there are countries like, or t- there are islands like Puerto Rico, which are very big and very industrial that are not. It's because they're in a they're in a, the path of some pretty bad weather for about six months out of the year. Can you, can you kind of pick on that a little or dig on that a little bit and talk yeah, to so that? that? That's also one of the reasons why we in Curacao think that we can take in that role. Because most of the Eastern Caribbean deal with, you know, all of these natural, different natural disasters on on the yearly um, yearly basis. We're not only talking about the hurricanes, but there are some active volcanoes on some of these islands as well. And there has been some activity on some of them as well. Montserrat most recently, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, where connectivity was totally um, uh, basically cut off uh, and the island was isolated for a while until they, con- you know, they, they connected the um, satellite connectivity and then after repaired the uh, subsea cable in order to bring the island back online. So Curacao is totally outside of the hurricane uh, belt. I will not say that we will never experience a hurricane, but if you look at the frequencies of hurricanes hitting our islands, it's one every 25, 30 years, as opposed to one every two to three years when you're looking at the Eastern Caribbean. So so, so that geographical location that we're at is also one of the main reasons why we think here is a safe place for people to store that critical information so that once they're ready, that they could, you know, get access to it again and and start doing their day-to-day business again. And so, all right, so um, this is all good. So you go from the kid in the corner who nobody's paying attention to, to 45 million connected um, citizens and lots of businesses and lots of for-profit businesses. You know, we know Aruba is really big for financial services. Um, you know, there, uh, there's manufacturing that happens on Puerto Rico, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and now all of a sudden you're a target. Um, you're a target for... Hackers for ransomware folks for you know people that want to get in and do not good things. How do you protect that? And is this you know is this where kind of Hillstone starts to come into the equation and you know becomes part of the the story? Yeah, well, I guess it, it's very important um, when you're tr- starting to build out or starting to go on a endeavor like this one is that you do everything you know from from the origins of things. So security should be something that we're building into our system from bottom up, right? It's, it shouldn't be an afterthought. And yes, this is where organizations like Hellstones come in because even though we are experts in, 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 in the storage and, and that part of this business, security isn't one of the things that we have all of that um, expertise in it. And then you need to approach organizations like Hillstone. And I had the pleasure to meet Hillstone and, and talk to them about our plans, especially when it comes to the creation of what we're calling the Caribbean Data Center Association, which is the network of data centers in the region that we are going to create connecting all of the islands. And when you build that network and you take cybersecurity and the security of information in it by design, Using the experts at Hillstone, then I think we will have a product that um, even though you should always be prepared, but if you take all of these aspects into con- consideration from the foundation and build it up, I think we have a better chance of protecting and providing that service level that we are going to offer to our to our customers out in the region. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Giovanni, let me jump into discussion at this point here. So, uh, I, I, you know, I'm also in the Caribbean at the moment, uh, and I just yesterday provided a, a conversation around uh, challenges, uh, I will say, to data center providers or even uh, ISPs and, and expand a little bit the conversation to, you know, providing uh, data services and uh, applications to that size of population and those people. So I was touching base on, you know, how to protect inter- in the interconnection of all of those networks. So I, we see this as a challenge. Uh, also, I think you mentioned a little bit on, on that, uh, uh, how to secure legacy technology. So uh, it's not easy to just, okay, let's uh, put Houston on, on the game here and start 
changing boxes and and storage and and just get the the you know the uh, uh, cutting edge technology and just forget about what's before that. So it's not something we I think you can afford to do it. Uh, the third part is um, actually uh, uh, providing uh, security to uh, protecting sensitive data. So this is more like uh, you know privacy by design kind of a, a mindset. I think you kind of went through that as well. And finally, I think that the most uh, uh, you know iconic uh, challenge for you, and and I'm just asking if you see those things. Is how you deal with such a, a you know big surface. So we have this concept in cybersecurity, talking about uh, uh, service okay. surface uh, coverage uh, for all of those people accessing and interconnecting, and the islands and the subsea uh, fiber going on. So maybe you can touch base on how you see those challenges and uh, how you kind of uh, uh, dealing with that, if if you will, please. Well, I think it, it, it's a great deal of awareness creation that we need to do at different levels, right? So um, as you know, most of the times, one of our main um, shortcomings or threats, if you want, um, is the consumer, the end consumer. It's, it's the last person that gives, maybe not even knowing, gives the hackers access to our infrastructures through their devices because we're not looking at it. So. It's it's looking at all of the different aspects of cybersecurity and protecting the infrastructure. That's the only way that we feel that we need to go about it. So it's not only about putting in the boxes in place, not only uh, making sure that you don't get grant the incorrect people access to the facilities, because the end consumer is also somebody that you need to look at. As we are going to a process of digitalization, and for instance, again, looking in Curacao, where we are at the stage of um, digitalizing the whole um, education system, approximately, um, if I'm not mistaken, approximately 40,000 children, ranging from age four all the way to 18, will be getting full access to the whole um, um, internet and this digital you know, infrastructure that we're building. So if we don't educate them first as to how to move within the system, what you need to take into consideration when you're moving from one site to the next, how you're using the infrastructure, is it a secure connection when you go into a cafe and there is free Wi-Fi? Oh, let me jump onto this thing. Let me go and look at my school email, not knowing that you're basically potentially giving somebody access to that infrastructure that needs to be protected. So if we don't work at it from all of these sides and with experts at the different levels, we will not be able to protect. And that's why I'm saying, like just you have just mentioned, it should be um, considering cybersecurity from the design phase. Now, when you're looking at the um, um, when you're looking at the the the, the legacy infrastructure, I, I think there is a different level of expertise which. Again, we're looking at organizations like Hillstone to come in and tell us, well, you know, nice, when you're doing something new, we'll do it by design. We'll incorporate it in your process of building out. But all of this legacy part of your infrastructure, and, and I maybe it, it doesn't sound correct, but even when you're looking at the legacy um, um, employees <laughs> that are part of this infrastructure, how do we need to take deal with them if we want to protect this 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 in its totality and again we are bringing on new challenges because now we're storing more information people are giving information away for free and it always brings us back and and this is how i try to look at it maybe a, a holistically isn't the right the right phrase or name to give it but there's always three parts of protection that i would consider when i'm looking at building out this infrastructure. It's about data protection itself. So the personal information, the critical information, how do we make sure that, that there are processes in place that can guarantee that we're dealing with this information in a proper way? Then there comes the, the level of um, um, data um, security, where you would then bring in the equipment, um, you know, and, and all of the things that you need to protect the information. 
and also the last, which is the, the data um, sovereignty because countries now would like to know where is my data stored? Is it in the cloud? Oh yeah, where is the cloud? You know, is, yeah. is the cloud somewhere in, in, in China or in Timbuktu or in Curacao? Where in Curacao is this information? So this is all of these things are, are the moving parts that we need to consider when we're looking at this. There's a lot of moving parts you mentioned. How much do you rely on partners like Hillstone to help you navigate? Like I said, from 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 the bottom up, you cannot do it without them because by not bringing them in from the get go, there will be aspects that you would miss. And 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 like like Andre has indicated, we are dealing with new rollout, new build out. Like I indicated myself, we're right now in the process of rolling out fiber to the home. So there are things that we need to do from now moving forward in these new parts, but there is the legacy part of it as well. What can we do to guarantee that there were in the past, we didn't put so much attention on the cybersecurity aspects of a network. How do we do it now? You know, so how do we protect that part of the infrastructure so that you don't jeopardize the whole um, in its totality and basically make a project like this one fail? So, so it be dependent on them. So it seems like the story here is Hillstone brings two unique values to uh, Blue Nap in this equation, right? The, the first is the technology that you know gets deployed and helps um, lock things down, secure, um, manage access, et cetera, et cetera. The other is the people and the experience that comes with you know having done this before um, and all of that that breadth of experience and depth of experience that they can bring to the the equation. This must be really interesting because. You are truly bringing a, a, a whole new digital generation online. I mean, this is like you're going from, you know, stop to 100 miles an hour pretty quickly or 100 kilometers an hour pretty quickly. Um, so I have to think that the role that, you know, like Andre and his team are going to play is pretty vital to what to uh, to Blue Nap being successful and in, in doing this secure access for for all of the Caribbean. Oh, most definitely. And, and again, um, and when you're looking, when you're looking at this uh, map, is we are building out. Governments are going to the process of digitalization. We are building secure networks for government um, in order to transport data between ministries, between different entities, and the data center itself, right? And and you don't want to have that one point of failure um, within such an infrastructure, considering that you're now really dealing with critical information, personal information. How do you store it um, locally that it's safe, but how do I guarantee that in the case of whichever um, 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 failure in the system that we have, that my system is backed up um, properly? Um, how do I guarantee or let people know how to deal with it? So it's, again, very important not to make it only about the infrastructure, but to make it about education, to make it about awareness. So you're looking at organizations like Hillstone to bring in information, bring in the knowledge, but also to make sure that we can train and create the level of awareness, not only with us that are technical experts, but also with the end consumer. Yeah, you know, it's funny. The uh, There's a statistic out there that says, uh, in the U.S., at least, the largest uh, source of the largest challenge that companies face are phishing attacks. And yes. phishing attacks are targeting the lowest common denominator, which are people, right? It's always, at the end of the day, it's always about people. You can have the best technology, but if, you know, people aren't educated and they're not aware um, and you're not reinforcing that over and over again, you're always going to be challenged by that. Oh, yeah. that's for sure um, that in my previous job, I, um, with the regulator, we have seen how um, organizations with millions of, and millions of dollars invested in all of these boxes that were supposed to protect them of the most um, highly thought out um, cyber attacks yeah. failed <laughs> because yeah. the, the most simplest thing, somebody yeah. just, you know, clicked on the link in an email that they got yes. without really checking it. Somebody's yep. taking a, a thumb drive into their laptops without knowing because they found it on the ground and they said, you know, oh, I could use this. 
So okay. those, those are the things that we think we really, really need to put attention to. We are bringing up a new generation of digitally able younger generations that this is the only thing that they're going to know and they're going to use. So we need to put that 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 effort in making sure that they know how to deal with with this new, you know, vehicle that we're creating for them to navigate the globe. Yeah, and then that's critical. So uh, the, the education and uh, how people deal with technology because they're not going to stop. We are in the middle of this digital transformation. So it's not the way to to say we're going to completely avoid threats uh, and completely. Forget about the, all the uh, the explosion of data that we're living in at this point. So let, I'm just gonna shift gears a little bit and and talk about uh, maybe the same way, but think about your operation. So your team uh, or the teams that deal with this process. So it's not that's not gonna go uh, even uh, to be solved in a, in this uh, in this way of thinking. But how the operation goes, uh, you touch base on some of that stuff. So uh, the policy. So what I do if I get hacked, you know, uh, because I'm not going to avoid that anyways. Uh, and we see the numbers. We have some numbers to even to, to share in another moment. Uh, so the operations and uh, the, the attack surface. So you're not going to either uh, just cover all the, your surface. So yeah. maybe you can give some ideas to us and see how how you see the, the operation side. I mean, uh, how uh, you know we have this solution at Houston. You know, it's not the point here to go into details about uh, Houston solutions, but we say uh, detect and response. So operations to, to detect uh, threats and have a response, adequate response to that when that happened. That should be thought before the threat happens, right? So how you see all that and how you see your, your teams uh, dealing with that, maybe in a kind of a secure operations center kind of a thing or network operations center. So how you see that? And I'm curious about it. You, you, you bring up very interesting points. Like I said, I mean, from a regulatory perspective, I've been around in, in this industry for a while. Uh, managing a data center. I've been in it since um, November 1st, 2022. Um, so when I came into the, to, 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 to this organization, one of the things that I was confronted with um, directly by um, cybersecurity experts is like, well, most of the times you focus, and again, when you mention, you know, the, the, the whole surface of at, that you need to look at um, when you're looking at someone securing your, your facility, most of the times we're looking at the IT aspects of our infrastructure, right? So are the servers um, well protected? Are, you know, are they behind a firewall? What are the procedures um, that we need to work at? But I fail to realize that there are a bunch of OT equipment that also have connectivity that can also become vulnerabilities oh, yeah. for our facilities. So are these protected? Are these OT um, um, equipment behind firewalls? Uh, if nobody would have educated me on this fact, and I'm happy that within my organization, I have people that have the knowledge and the understanding of this. So um, yes, these are very important things that we need to understand. You need to know everything that one way or the other could be a vulnerable um, component within, within your organization. And again, that's why I'm saying, it is impossible to build such an infrastructure that we are aiming to build without bringing in experts from different fields because it's very easily that people would say, well, I brought in a cybersecurity expert. Yes, but in which area of you know, cybersecurity? Because if, if somebody is only looking at the servers but fail to realize that all of my... Um, PLCs also have connecting connections to the internet, that all of my UPSs have a connection to, to the internet, that all of my air handling equipment has connections, that my whole building is managed by a, 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 an application that is connecting and talking to the rest of the world without us looking at it um, on a daily basis. These are also vulnerabilities that we need to be looking at. And that's why, um, exactly why you indicated you need to make sure that you have the right partners 
and that the right partners can advise you as to all of the elements that you would need to look at in order to guarantee, well, not guarantee, but to create the, the ecosystem that would enable you to protect the, the important data that is stored here at the maximum of your capabilities. Think, thinking about doing this on your own is crazy. <laughs> it is. I think that is a that is a very salient point. Trying to do this on your own is crazy. And I love the fact, you know, Hillstone as a partner and Andre in particular, I know your background, your experience has been in kind of, you know, you're you're based in Sao Paulo and you've done a lot of, you know, enabling of the more rural areas of, of Brazil. You've kind of gone through some of this experience and you you I'm sure you've learned lots of lessons and it's, you know, it's it's built some applicability and some um, muscle memory that you can bring and, and uh, help assist Giovanni and his team with as well. So it seems like a really good match between the two of you. Oh yeah, I believe so. I, I definitely think so as well. And and I I must say that from from Blue Nav's perspective, um, hopefully within the coming weeks, um, we will even have a project that goes out to schools um, and wow. do awareness creation. At that level, we want to make awareness creation when it comes to cybersecurity in its totality to be part of the curriculum because we are bringing all of these students and teachers online. And the nice thing about this is this would be an application, a service that would be one of the first that we're offering out of our data center facilities going towards South America and the Caribbean in, in its totality. It's a very nice application because we think starting at the foundation yep. is where we need to start. And then yep. you build up from there. While, you know, while Andre and the staff support us to close the gaps in what we have already um, in our legis um, um, legacy um, part of our infrastructure and support us in making sure that the new parts are basically secured by design. Excellent. My only suggestion would be, just, hold on, Steve, just one thing. My only suggestion would be find some way to block TikTok before uh, you roll it out to the kids because that thing just takes up hours of time. <laughs> Sorry, Steve, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, I think that's a great place for us to, to land, right? I don't know that we're going to do better for an ending. Uh, yeah. Giovanni and, and Andre, of course, as always, thank you guys very much for uh, for helping us out today. It's been a great yeah. conversation. Oh, yeah. And we'd like to ask you to come back in the next few months and kind of give us an update on, you know, what the role it's been like, what lessons you've learned, experiences you've had. This is a fascinating story, I think, will um, will be interesting to a lot of our listeners and viewers. So please come on back and, and let us know how it's going. And if I'm a, it for sure, we'll come back anytime that there is a development. And um, I, I, I hope you guys, um, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to meet Hillstone because Hillstone is a, is a one of the uh, companies that always participates in um, the Canto conference, and Canto uh, will be in July there. So hope to see you there as well, Andre. And um, you know, um, uh, virtual meetings are nice. Personal meetings is the ones that I think um, create the best and and the biggest connection. So yes, I will always be open to come back. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.